How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I was on another interview. Had to finish up and get over here to you. Man, listen, I'm doing You're so busy? much today. You know I take care of my parents. So I'm in the middle of, y'all going to have to excuse me because during this interview, I got to go check on the oven and y'all going to go on a tour with me. So, uh, you know, glad you know it's all good. But how you doing, Al? Man, I'm I'm blessed. Ooh. I'm blessed. Ooh, bro. Hey, we got we got your boy C Love in the room. I see C Love, in there. I see C -Love down there. <laughs> I see my man. Hey, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you so much for your time. You know, um, it's kind of like my way of paying homage to you guys who, who've been doing their thing. Plus, you it ain't just just been doing your thing. You still doing your thing, man. And and I watch and I learn from you, cats. Seriously. Mm -hmm. And I want to also give. Um, your assistant Shay, so much credit, man. She's professional. She's prompt. She she's on it, man. She she has a beautiful soul. You you got a beautiful team, bro. Okay, I appreciate it, bro. No doubt, no doubt. All right, let's start at the very humble beginnings. Born and raised in Cleveland. Absolutely. Okay, what school did you go to? Um, I started off uh, my high school. I went to Shaw Shaw High School. I went to Collinwood high school for a minute but i'm an east clevelander where shaw is from so you know uh okay. shaw high school went to collinwood high school went to marshall for a minute but shaw is the school that i represent in east cleveland okay no doubt did you play any sports or anything um, i played football in junior high school but um i boxed from the age of nine to uh about almost 19 years old around give or take and um that was my main sport was boxing um, so that's what I did. Yeah, I had about like eighty, you, about, you, about you, eighty you, fights, huh? Eighty fights. Mm -hmm. And you achieved Golden Glove status, yes, correct? Sir. Man, these yep. guys AAU, better be careful. AAU that. National Pile, uh, Diamond Gloves, a host of uh, other tournaments or whatever. Yeah, so boxing was my my favorite sport. Still. What inspired you to get in boxing? Um, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, those guys, you know, just growing up, seeing them, and um, just inspiring me to want to box. Yeah. Mm. Hey, Cats, better be careful running up on these R&B singers. Ain't no <laughs> <laughs> So how did you transition into music? At, at, at what age did, did you really start to be like, all right, I'm about to go ahead and start working on these vocals? Um, I knew that I could sing since I was four or five years old. So I always, music has always been my first love. Um, so, you know, that was my thing. Um, singing, uh, writing as I got a little older when I could write and put uh, things down, you know, write stuff down. Um, that's what I love doing. Um, so, you know, singing has always been a part of my life, man. I really didn't go outside much as a youngster. You know, I stayed in, I honed my craft, I practiced, wrote, stayed at the record player, and just studied the game, man. You know, the kids used to tease me and be like, Joe can't come outside. I used to be like, I don't want to come outside. I didn't want to play. <laughs> my play and my enjoyment was the world of music. So the only thing that really brought me outside um, was to go box and practice and box. And, you know, like probably like in the, when I was in the eighth grade, I played on the football team for Kirk Junior High and Kirk Middle School and um, stuff like that. I played Little League Baseball um, for a few years. I was good at baseball. I was a good base stiller. So that's what I did. And, um, you know, that's that's what I, as far as that. But, you know, I've been always knowing that I could sing and that music was in me, you know. So I grew up, like, telling people, like, hey, man, when I grow up, I'm going to have number one hit songs. I'm going to win awards. I'm gonna, and I'm going to sing to millions of people. Um, and, you know, I felt that inside. And so that's exactly what happened. You know, speaking in existence, putting in the work, you know, um, into my craft. And, you know, because I love, I love music and I love it. And, you know, things, um, what you put in, in into things that you want, you get out of it. So, you know, this, I'm a true testament of that. Okay. So, um when was the first time you actually performed, like a talent show or anything? Um, my first time singing was in church um, as a little kid. I had my first solo was called I Love the Lord, and I sung that. And um, when I sung that, it was amazing. It, I just knew something was special about me because of the way that the people reacted in the church. I went to a huge church, Temple Baptist Church in Cleveland, 
And uh, when I sang and I opened up my mouth and all the way through, people was crying and shouting. So I knew something was going on. So it only uh, just helped, you know, in the school choir. I sung in the school choir um, and then just started to become part of talent shows and whatnot. And um, that was my thing, man. I was I was the talent show king. I was, you know, I ran through. I ran through. <laughs> you that guy. Listen, I ran through Cleveland on the talent show scene, man. It got to the point, and I'm I'm not bragging. I'm just telling facts. It got to where kids, when I come in for audition, they're like, oh no, you know, you know what I'm saying. So they started just making me like a guest. You know, I couldn't win. I couldn't win nothing. They made me the guest, so I was just like, all right, cool. So yeah, that's basically um what the talent show thing was for me. Yeah. And um and on on to just uh being part of uh you know the Rude Boys as like a local group. Okay, now how did that start? You know, Rude Boys coming Well, together. I met the great Edward Banks, Buddy Banks at church. Um rest in peace, buddy. Um I met him, uh he was singing. He had just came into church, I guess he was a guest singer. And when this dude opened opened his mouth, man, believe me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He pound for pound was the best person at that time that I heard singing in person. I heard the Stevie Wonders and the Donny Hathaways and all the church, great church singers and all that, Aretha Franklin. But this dude, um, pound for pound, was just as good as these guys, man. And um, uh, it, it was it was amazing, you know? It, it was an amazing thing. Um, and it just drew me. It drew me to him. We started singing. Uh, we started a gospel group called Power, which was constructed of uh, Buddy, my friend Mark Jenkins, uh, this guy named Eric Davis, and myself. And um, we we did a little. We, we we lasted for a little while as a gospel group, maybe for about a couple years. And then um, Buddy came to me, and he was just like, "Man, we need to start a group, an R and B group." And I was like, "All right, cool. What's the name? You know, we got to come up with a name." He's like, "Rude Boys." I'm like, well, what's where the rude boys come from? <laughs> buddy, buddy had um, looked on a button on Prince jacket on the Controversy album, and it had Rude Boy. So that's where the rude boy. Oh. That's what the rude boy, where the rude boy's name came from. Wow, that that man, Prince. Wow, tie that in. Mm -hmm. that's, Prince. That's crazy. So it's, Prince is part of my legacy, man. The name, you know, definitely. Wow, that that's amazing. So so when did you bring the other guys in? Um, well, but it started with me and Buddy, and then we got a, a band. We was actually a band that got in on drums named Rick Scoville. On bass was Kyle Morris, on keys was uh, uh Troy Henderson, and then he brought in Melvin Cephas, which would be one of the original rule boys, and he got Larry. Uh Marcus actually was a guy named Larry Field Potts that was with us, but they like kind of kicked him out the band and replaced him with Larry, who soon became like one of the leaders of the group as far as not lead singer, but one of the guys that was kind of guiding us and the main songwriter. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm sure y'all did a bunch of shows. How did you end up running into Gerald? Great question. So, listen, we was doing local gigs around Ohio and, you know, around the state, the whole state of Ohio. And um, we was a group. And so I hung out with Eric uh, Benke Grant, Nolan Grant from the OJs, the youngest guy that's in the okay. OJs. Me and him became real close. And so it, back then it was a gong show scene. And so, you know, I used to be in the gong shows with him and, you know, competing with like older guys. I was in the bars and the clubs before I was supposed to be. But he told me about this place called The Reason Why. And um, at The Reason Why was this lady named Evelyn Wright, who used to sing a jazz, like a jazz singer, but she sung all types of songs. And uh, she would be there hitting with the band. So when I went there, he told me about it. I got in. One of the Cleveland Browns, Ron Bolton, and his wife, Kuja, they owned it. And um, he would let me come through the back door. And um, I would just really, I was there for the music because they had a live band and it was like an atmosphere that I really liked. And so um, Eric introduced me to Evelyn and then Evelyn, uh, in turn, she um, used to allow me to come up to sing. So I used to come up every week, like, shoot, I'm coming. And she used to allow me to sing with her or sing something that the band knew. So I told one of my brothers in the Rule Boys, buddy, I was like, man, you need to come up to the reason why. It'd be going up there, you know, it'd be a lot of girls and it'd be jumping and it's just like, it's, the band is great, the ladies sing. He's like, oh yeah, I know some of them. So he met me up there one night 
and she let us sing. Uh, we said we was going to sing every, a song called Everything, Everything Must Change. And so we're in the song, and we're singing the song. And I look on the steps, which it was some down a downstairs part to it. So in the middle of the steps, down on the landing, I seen Gerald LaVert standing there. And I was just like tripping, like, dang, that's Gerald LaVert from LaVert, right? Then had Casanova <laughs> out. And, you know, that was a big hit. Um, My Favorite Love and all that had been out. And we actually sung some of their songs with our band because we did a lot of um cover tunes also we was most mostly doing cover tunes and so i said hey everybody we got gerald lavert from lavert here man gerald why don't you come up here and sing with us and gerald was looking like man this dude <laughs> didn't call me up and so he came up and sang with us he didn't turn us down and man it was a very explosive performance man it was great i must say um to this day i never forget it you know um it's just in my mind this is how i got discovered and so uh it, it was great. It was a great thing that Gerald LeVert took us on to be, you know, an art, artist that he wanted to back. Um, he told us to meet him at the house the next day. And uh, we met there. I couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> but me and Buddy went there. <laughs> uh, we went up the stairs to go see Gerald. And up there was Eddie LeVert. So I'm like, whoa, this man, what the heck? <laughs> I've been studying his song. And my favorite song from the OJs at that time was Brandy. Um yeah. Okay, yeah. And so I'm like, oh, snap. Ellie Bird is up here. You know what I'm saying? And um, I was instantly nervous, man. I remember my mouth went dry. My, it was white around my mouth. I was so nervous, man. <laughs> and um, what's crazy is that we were talking, and then somebody came in and was like, Gerald, some, someone's on the phone for you, Troop. Uh, Steve Russell from Troop. And Steve on the, on the speaker said, Gerald, thank you for our first number one record. So Gerald had just produced the song and wrote Mama Sita for them. And uh it went it just it went number one the day that I got there, which was on a Wednesday. And um, you know, I was like, Wow. <laughs> when I heard that come on speaker, I'm like, I'm in the right place. You know, the brother called yeah. thanking Gerald for a number one hit. I was like, that's what I done told everybody I'm gonna do. So me and Buddy sang, I sucked. I didn't really sound good to myself, but you know, the reputation that I had built up for myself as being a great singer in Cleveland. But they still liked it. And um, I remember Gerald like, well, Pops, what you think? And um, Eddie was like, ah, oh, they all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. so he's like, I'm going to work with y'all guys, man. And uh, we went on to uh, work with Gerald. Um, we immediately got started, and our first album came out. And from our first album, we had two number one hits. we well, smashing a hit. A smash and written all over your face to me, number one. Then a song that I wrote called Are You Lonely For Me. That went number one on the R&B charts. And then that year, we got R&B Song of the Year for the Billboard Awards. It went to the Billboard. I grabbed my Billboard Award from Garth Brooks. So, you know, that's the company. What? Yeah, that's the company we was in. So, you know, at that point, I knew Man, then that I made it. I didn't come off two number one songs. Got a Billboard Award. First album, Rookie Year. Got hardware and won a championship. First time out, two championships at that. It was really hard getting a number one song on a on a on the chart. So off an album, you get two number ones. That's phenomenal, man. And an award. I mean, yeah. I, it was just like what I said when I was a little boy when I told everybody. So I always tell people the manifestation is real. When you feel something inside, you feel that burning fire inside. Just know that it's something real, and you have to put in that work. Um, you got to put in that work, you know, when you feel it, you know, um, you know, so I love music so much that, you know, I put my whole life into it and, um, God has been really good to me and I'm thankful for, uh, just this journey that I'm still on and I'm still riding and I'm still able to eat, still able to perform for people all over the world. And, um, I just, I'm, I'm so thankful. Al. Wow. That, that, that's an amazing journey. Let, let me ask you this. Your first time on Arsenio mm -hmm. Hall, I watched you guys because I, I was just so proud. You're like, man, these cats from around the way, they on Arsenio. Tell me about your first experience on Arsenio man, Hall, shit. man. I got to tell you about the experience on the Apollo, Soul Train, Arsenio, twice. I mean, those, I'm going to just put them all in one. I knew that that's where I belong. I was amazed, though, at that time. I mean, it was just everything was moving so fast. I was one week I'm on the Apollo, next week I'm on Soul Train, then I'm on Sar Arsenio, then we get invited back to Arsenio. At that time, it was a show called uh, um, um, Party Machine. Nia Peoples was hosting. We did that on the same yeah. day as we did Soul Train. I mean, it was just amazing, man. Um, 
a great journey, I must say. You know, it was a great, great journey. It has been a great journey, and I'm just thankful. You know, I was, you know, Apollo was the first show that I was ever nervous on, though. Yeah. Really? Why, why were you so nervous about man, the Apollo? Because notorious <laughs> Apollo. They boo people. They boo <laughs> artists, like professional, known artists. So going on there, I knew I had to do my thing. You know, but we had Gerald yeah. with us because he performed written all over your face with us. So it was it was it was cool, man. You know, we did the Apollo twice actually too. So, you know, we uh but but you know, hey, love love loved it, loved it, loved the journey. How did you come up with Are You Lonely for Me? What what was the whole the, the story on that song? You know, it wasn't really a story. We um had went to Columbus. Uh, it was me, a guy named Dwight Thompson. Uh, Mike Ferguson and Tony Nicholas. And um, we went to Columbus to work with Tony Nicholas, who became, you know, we wrote Are You Lonely together. And um, he would go on to write many hits and great albums with Gerald Laverta and myself. And um, he started playing the song, some chords, and I just started singing the verse. You know, I've been away for a while, but now I'm back to stay. And he was playing. And then he came in with, well, I want to know if you're with me, girl. And we was just singing. And it just it just came together, man. And, and it was a song that I just kept uh, uh, writing. And, and it, was, it was great, man. It was an amazing moment, you know. But the real deal was written all over your face. Now, when we did that, dude, the, the energy in the studio, that song is a smash because... The energy that we had that day was amazing. And if you go to the end of the song, you hear us talking, and we, like, excited, man. We knew that this record was going to be amazing. I didn't know it was going to be that big, but I knew that it was going to be amazing. But it turned out to be a classic. Still now today um, is in, is in, yeah. is in uh, medium rotation everywhere around the country. It's played every day in every city and every state. So, you know, I'm thankful for that, too, man. Like I said, man, God has been great. God is great, and this journey has been amazing, and the journey continues, you know, and I, I'm just thankful to be able to be in the land of the living to, you know, project my talent and put it out here. Man, yes, that is an amazing journey. Now, you as a, you started, uh, you worked on a solo project, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Putting It Down was an album that came out in 95 on Atlantic Records after the Rude Boys. We wasn't on Atlantic no more, but they kept me as a solo artist and did pretty good. We have, I have a song called The Hump Is On that was wrote by Gerald and Tony Nicholas and myself. And then we had a song called Me And You that uh, Gerald had wrote for me. And um, it, it sold pretty good. So like probably 150,000 copies without like great promotion. And that was it. It was very short lived and, you know, you know, it went on and after that just, you know, would just continue to uh, write and produce. Did a lot of writing, producing for a lot of people who's who's in the business. Okay, cool. What was the best piece of advice you ever got from anybody that's in the industry? Save your money. <laughs> <laughs> Save your money. You know, don't don't be stupid with your money. But I was stupid, of course. You you take a young you take a young man. You take that. so many people. Gerald was the first one. Uh, and the main person, uh -huh. he took me to dinner. He's like, dude, you about to make a lot of money because I just got like a publishing deal for 250000 and then money was just coming in, man. So you take a young man at the age of his mid-20s and you give him, you know, he make a million or a couple million of dollars, you know, a few million dollars, and you know, you didn't really, you, you don't come from a bad place, from the mud all the way, but you come from a household where two parents got to work hard to provide and you just get everything. You got everybody waiting hand and foot on you. You got women all around the world want to be your girl. You got all kind of guys and everybody want to hang around you because you're popular. And you, you spend money. You, you you have fun. And that's what I did. If it, I had a lot of fun. So, you know, but, um, you know, God is good. And, I you know, I had to learn through some trials and tribulations. And, you know, I stand before you here today, 2021. Um, as a witness to just, you know, tell people to just, you know, when, when you are blessed and when God blesses you um, with with something that you got to learn how to keep it. You got to learn how to nurture it and take care of it, man, um, and, and, and continue to practice and continue to hone your craft. And, you know, you know, because this music is a gift that keeps give, on giving. And basically, our, us as artists, when we're rappers, singers or whatever, poets or, whatever, even athletes, whatever, we're giving this gift to entertain people and touch people's lives at the end of the day. 
It's not always about yeah. you. It's about the people and the, and the lives that you touch. So you have to be careful of the stuff that you write and the content that you put out here and the energy that you put out here, man. It's very important to, um, you know, especially when you get older and as you grow and you learn, you have to be able to positive vibes man positive energy that's very important you know that's what helps make the world go around if we could push more love out and more positive things yeah now off of that growing up in a two-parent home how, how was that uh influential towards you that you very fortunate very fortunate to have a mother and a father's love very fortunate to come up in a kind of strict household which i left home early i left at 16 going on 17 because I didn't want to go by my mother's rules and she told me well, if you can't go by I leave so I started smelling myself and wanting to get out in the streets and I started running the streets and stuff and selling drugs at a young age just being in gangs and all kind of stuff man and um, I was glad that God brought me out of that I ended up going to the penitentiary at a very young age like at 19 or something like that and um, you know doing a small amount of time and then getting out and being able to really still be able to do what the, my purpose was, what God had for me to do. So, but, you know, I was very heavily influenced by two lovely, beautiful parents who are still living now, and I'm fortunate to have them. I actually uh, had to move back to Cleveland um, after my wife passed in 2016, and when I was getting ready to leave to go back to Atlanta, uh, my parents needed me. So I, I stay here, and I take care of my parents. My studio is here at their house, and I'm able to do everything I need to do. But I wake up to two beautiful people every day of my life that I'm thankful um, for having and thankful that they encourage me and push me forward to be um, the best person that I can be and, you know, to utilize my gifts. I'm real big on mental health, and I know that you have dealt with a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. What was your coping mechanism for, for the losses that you've endured? How, how, how did you get through those moments? Um, to understand that, listen, at the end of the day, when we lose people, it's God's work. There's nothing that we could do to add to or to take away from situations when we lose people. It's not our fault. It's not their fault. It's all a part of something that we all have to face one day. So, you know, I utilize that as to be a motive motivator to be a better person each day and to live life to the fullest and to love myself understand who I am and to, so that I can love others properly. Um, and that's very important. I always talk about self-love because self-preservation is the first rule of thumb and to understand who you are is uh, your key thing. We all are sitting here in this universe to uh, serve a purpose that God has for us to, uh, you know, go upon uh, assignments that God has for us and to touch lives and be bridges and segues for others. So, you know, just with the losses, it's hard. We mourn and we grieve, man. That's a part that's going to be a part of it. But you got to understand that we have life, man. God's mercy and grace each day for us to grow up is amazing. It's the greatest and sweetest gift that we have is to be able to be out here and get out 10 toes down and handle our business and, and handle the business of understanding who you are and being who you're supposed to be and touching the lives that you're supposed to touch. Man, and, and I feel you so much on that. I've dealt with loss, lost both my parents. And like I say, just every mm -hmm. day, like I tell people at work, I was happy to see the sun. Right. Morning. Hey, you got to be. Hey, listen, <laughs> man, because at the end of the day, when someone passes, it can be you. You still here. So what you going to do about your life? What you going to do? Are you going to love better? Are you going to love yourself better? Are you going to love others better? Are you going to like just, you know, give it, give your all while you're here in a positive way, man? You know, I've been negative in the past, but, you know, I try to be as positive as I can. Now, sometimes, you know, people are getting your square, get you up out your square, up out your hookup. And make you have to, you know, revert back to who you used to be or make you mad. But you just have to find a way to, uh, Reaction. Reaction is everything. How you react to things is the key to how situations go. So, you know, um, I just, just, you know, I just monitor myself, man. And, um, just try to make wise decisions for myself. Yeah. And I think the, the older we get, the more we can apply looking back to move That's forward. It. That's real, bro. Now, as you transition, music is the business. The coffee. What made you get into the coffee mm, business? Sir? That's crazy, man. The coffee <laughs> business. Um, just uh, being, uh, having really nothing to do, 
came across a couple of dollars and I wanted to invest it, you know, um, and uh, my a cousin, a family member of mine, Terrell Howard, um, was just like, yeah, man, we, you sh we should do a coffee shop. You know, that's the going thing, college students. This was like in about 2008. Um, so, you know, I'm like, all right, we're cool. So coffee, coffee shops, you know, I just, to me, well, what coffee we going to serve? So immediately I started thinking of self-branding. You know, I was in an era where you seen P. Diddy do some stuff, had the stuff out, L L had the FUBU out and, um, you know, a different Russell Simmons had the fat farm and you seen all these brothers with cross colors and then rock away all that stuff. You seen entrepreneurship. So I was like, well, what if I make my own coffee brand and created and we got together, we teamed up, came up with the name Urbane Joe Coffee. And uh, we just started going upon our journey of getting our own branding. And eventually we did. And so it's been in existence since around 2009, 2010 to current day and it's doing pretty well online. I've had uh, several coffee shops, which I've closed, but I love e-commerce. I love promoting coffee and uh, coffee helps make the world go round. It's the second biggest commodity commodity in the world after oil. A lot of people don't know that, but you look it up, it's quite, no. fright, quite, quite staggering and frightening the numbers with coffee do, <laughs> bro. So, I mean, it, it's on point and, uh, you know, I love, I love being in the business of coffee. So you're you're quite the entrepreneur. You you got you seem like you got a serious sense of hustle about yourself. Ah uh, yeah, man. You know it's it's not too much so much about the hustle, but it's it's all about me just knowing what my purpose is, man, and that I got work to do. And while I'm here, I want to make the best of this life and do as much as I can, you know, to touch lives and to live a good life and set set a, create a legacy for my children and my grandchildren and their children and their children and their children. You know what I'm saying? So that's my goal at the end of the day. That's dope. Let, let me ask you this. How do you feel about the, um, the media portrayal of black men nowadays? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's rough, man. You know, it's always been a, a bad portrayal of black men since the slavery days when we were, um, you know, just made a fool of, man, in front of our families and, you know, just just abused men and we were men and women were abused black slaves were but i mean you know for like a master to sleep with your wife and give her a baby and then you got to walk around watching your wife or your mate pregnant with another man's child and come out as not yours but you still got to stick with your woman because you know it ain't they fault um just to be um ostracized in front of your peers all the time to made a made a, um Took, uh, made an example of different things like that has been rough into current times, you know, where there's a lot of things that has been done to the black neighborhood to set black men up to be in certain positions, especially with um, crack and different things put out like that, the crack era. And then just a lot of drugs fueled into the black neighborhoods over a while, with this, which not we wasn't our fault, but you know, some of us took the bait and the hook and got on, got on it or was selling it. So, it's been really hard, you know. It's like we've been tricked and bamboozled quite a bit. But um, this is the era right now where we are conscious of what we face here in America, and we need to find unity within the black community. Um, and it's very, it's very uh, imperative that this happens. Um, and we need more black leaders to speak out to, you know, for pe that people will listen to, you know, um, to try to build some type of camaraderie or unity amongst each other is very, very important. So, um, yeah, it's rough on the black man. It's rough on the black woman, too. I just believe it's rough on people of color overall. Um, no more of the men than the women. You know, we all have to really work hard and just be over the top and for, for us to advance. You know, everybody don't got a wicked jump shot. Everybody can't run a touchdown or throw a ball. Everybody can't sing their heart off or rap you know, wrap their ass off. So there's other things that we have to work hard at in order for us to um, count here in society. What are your, um, are you active in any, in any um, community uh, activities right now or charities that, that you support locally? Well, I've always been a part of my community here in Cleveland, uh, especially East Cleveland. I'm an activist. Um, I'm, I'm down there talking, you know, uh, feeding the homeless. Um, I've been giving out coats for kids in the wintertime, um, you know, doing things like that. I'm doing benefit concerts um, during the pandemic. 
um, and, and uh, co combining and collaborating with the food bank here in Cleveland to uh, generate money to provide food for people. So, yeah, that's what I'm about. You know, I'm about, you know, giving back and being part of the community because it's where I come from at the end of the day, you know. Yeah, I, I think community involvement is so important. Right. And I think people tend to think you have to have so much money to give back when give your time. Time is everything. That, that's look, it's look. called sweat equity, and it's worth a lot, man. When you give it, especially if you're giving it from your heart, it's very important. Yes, sir. Now, up-and-coming artists, anybody you working with right now? or um, I got an artist named De Niro. I think he's out there, man. I want him to request to come on if he's uh, out there. I want everybody to, to meet him. I'm working with that. And then um, I'm working with my guy. Uh, he's out there. He's out there, too. Louis McTush. Uh, we're working on a smokers campaign, non-smoking campaign uh, that we're working um, on. Um, are they on I know, um I see Lewis on here, but he's not going to come on. He just finished battling um, a COVID and he's dealing with, you know, getting back in good health. But I'm trying to, I'm looking for De Niro and I don't see him. Um, I see my sign on here, Sir 100. What's up, sir? If you want to come on, come on. It requests to be on. That's my son. Um, but uh, but De Niro, I do not see him. And I wanted him to come on and talk about real quickly about uh, the single that we got on, got out. But he's not on here. Yeah, I'm looking at the viewers. Um, and he is not here. So, um, De Niro is a new artist that I'm working with out of Cleveland. Uh, we have a single out right now um, called Run It Up. And me and him also had a duet called Solo that was out. Um, and just everybody go is D A D hyphen A N A R O. D De Niro. De Niro. D A. The uh, N A R O <laughs> De Niro. Um, so yeah, he's got a cutout called Run It Up. It's really doing good. He's streaming well, and the YouTube numbers are doing pretty good. I also work with an artist named Ferro Loco, which we got a song out called Beautiful. A young lady who's up and coming, dope, a dope writer um, and rapper and singer. Um, we got a single out, and um, just working with uh, Charles Reed, which is another one of my little brothers. Um, and uh, I see my boy Rodney Poe is out there from Black Street, but I think that he has uh, he's gone, and so I don't see him. And I'm, I wish De Niro was on here, but he's not. I uh, try to give him some spotlight and get him some love, but um, you know that's what I'm working. Well, well. So tell, tell him keep grinding. We're we're spinning yeah, no back. Doubt, I'll no definitely doubt. yeah. So just doing that and preparing to put out, you know, uh, a single start next month and putting out a new single every month. Videos to shake up the algorithms and doing that, man. So just a lot of stuff to come. I got a book called The Day of the Convincing Storyteller that I'm going to be publishing. I'm working on a kid's book called Joey's Big Day. Um, it's about me. It's about me. It's about little Joey, me, when I was little, about my first day in kindergarten when they kept telling me I was going to be a big boy. And it's about, you know, bullying, getting bullied on. <clears throat> and how did, you know, Bob and we even get through the bullies, you know. So uh, that that that's <laughs> something I'm working on, and um, <clears throat> just working on just with the Rude Boys. I got my group, the Rude Boys. We out. We get preparing to do some touring, and myself as a solo artist, preparing to do some touring and doing shows. Now that um, the country is opening back up, um, promoters are starting to call. So life is great, man. I just want to be here and be able to wake up every day to go do what I do. How, how do you think last year, the COVID season, how, how did that impact? It impacted you? greatly. It, 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 first of all, it gave me a time to sit back and think. So a lot of things uh, maturated over that time with me. And um, it was a good moment. I, I thank God for that moment for me, for me to get some clarity in my life, uh, for me to, you know, build new relationships and, you know, definitely a better relationship with myself and um, be able to concentrate on my coffee more and my music and put life in perspective in another way. You know, for, for the first time in the history of the world, the whole the whole world went through something together. I don't think there's ever been a yeah, time like that. Yeah. And we was here. We, we are here for it. So we've watched what, uh, what 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 can happen, you know, but we also watch how strong we can be. So, um, you know, just I, I come out of this pandemic, which is. These, this is uh, still going to be around, 
but you know, I lost some family members and close friends to COVID. My uh, group member, Buddy Banks, we buried him a couple months ago. He died of COVID, one of the original rude boys. So, you know, hey, there's a lot that was lost. Um, even my friend Lewis out there, McTush, who we working on the um, No Smoke campaigns, he um, got COVID. You know, he already had a stent in his heart and heart problems, but he fought through it. God, you know, bring him through it. I'm um, even here with my parents. My father fought a battle of hemophilia, was in the hospital for 40 days, and we didn't know if he was going to make it back home. And, um, you know, just a lot happened, man. And um, I'm just thankful that we come in the body here and the smoke is clearing a little bit. And um, But we still have to be st safe, um, you know, and I'm just very optimistic and, and with positive vibes about the future. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 seemed, it seemed almost like it was a, a, a cleansing. Like we needed to just stop our normal and adjust. Mm -hmm. And and realign ourselves with this. Right. That that's what I took. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, you you gained a new perspective. Re me personally, I gained a whole new perspective on everything. Right. Everything. Right. You know, because I think that was, that was the first time I was just kind of even unsure of what tomorrow. Was. Right. No doubt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it was definitely um, definitely challenging times. You know, and you being a fighter, I know you always up for the fight. Hey, man, listen, we are here. Listen, God give the, the, the some of the greatest challenges to his soldiers, and, you know, it's intended for us to conquer these challenges, to overcome. I mean, we can't be skilled at being who we are if we don't have challenges. So challenges bring yeah. forth growth. And when you're uncomfortable, that means growth. So there's going to be some uncomfortable times. There's going to be challenging times. But we have to look at it for what it is, is that, hey, good going to happen, bad going to happen. It's all about your reactions and how you deal with life and that you understand that you can make it through. You will make it through. Believe in yourself. Love yourself and know that, um, you know, you just have to be strong and, and, and pull through. No doubt. But what's crazy, though, is that you had touched on it earlier when you talking about how music affects mm -hmm. people. And music was a major crutch for people last Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Especially this time. Absolutely. A lot of artist streams went up um, due to people just being at home, listening to music and listening to their playlistings and stuff like that. So um, it was it was it was great. You know, um, we just have to, you know, it was it, this time of the pandemic. You when you, if you want to try to make something good of it, it was a time for us to be still and just, you know, reflect and just think about the future. If you didn't utilize this time to reflect and to um, become a better person and strategize and, and get your goals together and, you know, be ready to go for it once the doors break out here, then you wasted your you wasted time. You know, that's just the, that's just the way I feel at the end of the day. And you can't get that time. No, nah, man, as the clock tick, it don't go backwards, it go forward. So, you know, we all always should know that when we are in these times that is about uh, maximizing the now. So people be like, well, you know, in, in the word of God, it says, um, don't worry for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. But at the same time, you have to make conscious decisions to take care of the future you. You know what I'm saying? So I always had this analogy that I heard from Kara's. One is like if a kid is start started by and raised to take care of themselves for the future, the 10-year-old takes care of the 20-year-old, the 20-year-old takes care of the 30-year-old, the 30-year-old takes care, or even the shorter numbers, you know what I'm saying? The 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 the, 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 the 20-year-old takes care of the 25-year-old. You know, five years is a lot of time. You want to try to make great conscious decisions for and pivot and move for the future. You know what I'm saying? You want to make great decisions for yourself. So that counts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Who would you like to see the Rude Boys against in the verses? <laughs> who, who would I like to see? I don't, you know what? I don't know, man. I would go uh, maybe like Shy. You know, I'm going to pick some of the guys who really didn't have a lot of songs because we, we had a few songs. We got songs people know, but maybe like a Shy, that would be one of the groups, you know, that I think that we would team up pretty good with, you know. Um, of course, I'll pick on them. They're my friends, Garfield and the rest of the family. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I don't like to look at it as competitive. I like to look at it for us doing it for the culture. 
you know, at the end of the day. Exactly. It's not really about the competitive, man, because all of it comes from the talent that God has gifted us with. So at the end of the day, we would definitely be doing it for the culture. So, you know, it could be anybody, man. Shoot, I don't care. I just want to be on verses. <laughs> I want to be on unsung verses. Anything that's there uh, for me to be on, you know. So most definitely, man, um, I, I would say shy. I'll pick on them. That that that'll be a nice one, and and that's that's gonna bring back some serious baby making memories. Oh yeah, that's most definitely. <laughs> yep. So so, what advice would you have for a, a young aspiring artist that's trying to get into the game? Um, just you know, to hone your craft, practice, 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 build up your social networks, build you a fan base, do quality good music. Um, you know, and just, you know, hey, man, be thankful that God has allowed you and gifted you with the talent that you got and put in that work, put in the work, build up your fan base, work your social networks um, and that, you know, practice, 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 right, right, right. Studio, 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 baby. That's what it's all about. There it is. Brother, I want to thank you for your time, man. So much love and support you, for you and your endeavors. Your assistant Shay, she's amazing you. once again. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, just thank you so much for taking time out to mm -hmm. holler at me, and I I look forward to chopping up with you. Again. Thank you, Al Maker, man. I I appreciate you, and thank you, County, for allowing me to be on your show. Um, and I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, brother. All right, I'll holler at All you. All right, too. Al, take care, bro. All right, All right. you too.